All right, so I'm going to talk about objective data and uh, in a data-driven world. So what's happening is the whole, this whole world of chiropractic is changing quite dramatically. Um, and one of the reasons is that the whole world is looking for data every, in everything that we do. And so I'm going to discuss that, the changes occurring in our, in our profession and the importance of utilizing it and capitalizing on that. You know, you hear about the evidence-based model. This school is very oriented around that. Yet, at the same time, and one of the reasons the clinics actually integrated this, we had this discussion with the clinic uh, where we, we were saying, you, know, you get into a paradigm and you forget what your paradigm's all about. You forget that there's limits to it. And we started discussing, well, what are you doing that's objective now? After they saw the device being used, I said, well, what do you have now that's actually objective that you're using? And there was silence in the room because everyone realized that almost everything that we do is, is more towards the subjective end of things, you know. Um, with the exception of the range of motion measurements that you do, uh, most of the stuff is really subjective and you forget that it is. So, as far as my background, I was with the, uh, and if you have any questions, stop me please. I was with the space program, um, and uh, I was at NASA Ames Research Center. I was looking at hand controllers used to fly the F-16s and putting it into a helicopter cockpit. Everybody came out of the simulator and their arms were killing them, and it had to do with the muscle fatigue they were experiencing, so I decided to develop a technique for using service EMG back then for evaluating for muscle fatigue. So that's what led to a change in the hand controls that are used for this futuristic helicopter. And at, I was there when I was between 23, I think at 23 years old I went there, maybe 24, and at 26 I had written a grant proposal to the National Institutes of Health and they, I drank a couple beers and I wrote this thinking there's no way they'd ever, you know, give it to me. Uh, but it was for a half a million dollars and believe it or not, they, I got this grant. So the grant was to develop the Maya vision, which you see now. And so um, that, was, uh, that was when I was a uh, young age. And then what ended up happening was all these different chiropractors started using, and honestly misusing this equipment like crazy back in the 90s. And that's kind of led to you know, the impression, what kind of impression you have about it? Does anyone have any impression on this stuff? And please be honest, I don't, you're gonna be shocked at what you see as far as well, that's real. Yeah, I've, I've actually used it as a CA and um, from like the five or six times, not many that I used it. Um, it didn't really show us anything other than what we already knew from the patient and patient report. Okay, great. Um, but, you know, what about the patient's perspective on that? Um, you know, it seemed kind of time consuming. Of course, I was a newbie using it for the first time. Where was this? Cascade Chiropractic. So if you're in town. Um, but some people love having the printed out thing going, that's my lesion, you know? Right. And yeah. so um, there's definitely some benefits that way and they can see it on the screen and it's confirmatory. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also would say I found it extremely accurate. Like yeah. It was um, the same thing that we were finding and was being right. reported. Well, that's one of the things you bring up as far as this, it is, and you're talking, just so you know, there's two devices, and that's one of the things that happened in the class yesterday. People did not realize that there's an entirely different, there's two devices that have the same name, and that's been part of the source of confusion and an opportunity that exists and why I win every legal case I've ever been involved in. I've won every soft tissue case I've ever done because everyone assumes that's the only service EMG. So it makes it into a secret weapon. That's the static EMG you're talking about. We'll go over the differences. One of them's a, one of them, there's over 8,000 research studies published on. The other one is, is more of an electronic form of palpation. Mm -hmm. But critical about what you just said was, it's, it's when I go, when I, and I'll show a slide of this, but I, uh, we are extremely skeptical and critical about everyone in the world right now. We don't trust anybody. And one of the advantages of actually using something that shows the patient what's going on is it allows you to build a level of trust with them. Because of one thing, the device is, and you, so you experience the accuracy of it. Most people think it's not reproducible, et cetera, which is just nonsense, it works extremely well. This device does. There's a lot of machines that were terrible, they're all gone now. Those were what were sold, that's what made the reputation bad in this profession was the mis, the, the, the devices were just seriously poorly designed, poorly built, and just sold to, you know, to fool people. Um, I've never had that orientation. Uh, but uh, that building a trust is huge. And what happens is when it's accurate, the patient, there's this thing that occurs, and I've seen this happen so many times, it's amazing, where the patient, when you test them, you're showing something that goes on inside their body. They know it's there, 
and they forget. They've gotten desensitized to it. Like you can't feel your watch. They can't feel these things, and it becomes an awareness of them, right? You've seen, you've seen that happen yourself. And that awareness builds a level of trust with you because you just tested them with a the device which shows something they know is true, which makes you credible, and then they look to you for the solution because of the fact you're the one that exposed it. And I'll show the same thing in an analogy with uh, auto mechanics now. You're going to laugh away when I show you this. But anyways, let me go on forward here. Um, I did a bunch of, uh, I, uh, my course was endorsed by all the state associations in the U.S. where training was required, including the state of Washington. Um, I've lectured for all different colleges, and I was on a panel of experts on service EMG, the FCER did. Um, and I took on all the insurance companies in the state of Florida, all of it, the Supreme Court of Florida, establishing the validity of this tool, which is why insurance pays for it now, 100% uh, of the time. A uh, bunch of patents, et cetera. No one believes this, by the way. Oops. More, can CMCC had a course on this. Everyone thought that they, were, they would never, you know, I don't know if you knew that or not, but CMCC actually, I taught for 10 years at CMCC on this. That was a result of the SCDR thing. This is the most recent, this was about six weeks ago. A, um, this was a case that was a soft tissue case. The patient was a chiropractor and injured in an auto accident. When there's soft tissue injury, no broken bones, you can't prove it, right? Well, guess what, you can with this. That's one of the things, that's not a different tool than you know of. What was interesting about it was the fact there's an attorney that's got this endorsement here. Attorneys don't endorse anything. What happened was I hit the ball over the fence in a big way in this in this, in this case, the reason being is they thought that just like everybody has this negative image of service EMG or what it actually really is, uh, and the impact it had on this case was so huge that it led to an $800,000 settlement in a case that was valued at $0 by everybody. And that's what the result of this was, because I was able to establish clearly that there was an injury. Now what made, it, what made this extremely important, their expert witness, David Fish, He's the most expensive, they threw the most, State Farm hates me, but they threw the most expensive expert witness they could, $1,200 an hour. I've never seen anything like it before, ever. And he's a UCLA professor. His level of credibility is like, it's astronomical. But why did he lose? Every, and and it was, it was, this was my one for the attorneys. Why did he lose? Because I turned the discussion into one about objective data, which is indisputable. Thank you. Uh, it'll, that's fine. Uh, objective data and his, everyone realized, including the attorney, that matter of fact, when State Farm deposed me, they didn't even ask me questions except for how does it work? Because they're like, this is amazing. You turn the whole discussion from his expertise and his opinion, and my learned opinion is that this person's not injured, to the data shows she is. And what do you think the jury does? They actually are focused only on the data. That's why we always win all these cases. But it's shifting the whole mindset in the in this profession or what's important. So we're gonna cover a bunch of stuff. Now, what do you think the best way to document injury? I'm talking about auto accidents right now just because of the fact that it's very demonstrative as far as the value of this goes. What's the best way to, uh, to document uh, injury in an auto accident, would you guess? We're using clinometers. Right. Well, there's one way that's better than any. You ready? You saw it already, so. This is me six years ago. And <laughs> Attorneys typically have traditionally had issues dealing with chiropractors. Why would that be? Or using you in court cases or in soft tissue cases. Do you know what that's why? So many are crazy. <laughs> so many are crazy, okay. What else? In comparison to MDs, who has more credibility in the courtroom as far as attorneys go? MDs most likely do. That's what the issue really comes down to. And I figure it's, where is this coming from though? So I looked at the Gallup poll. Have you seen this? And I'm saying this not to put down chiropractors. I'm saying this prescriptively. What do we do to fix it, right? This is the, Gallup, the current Gallup poll. And the only thing someone pointed out was police officers are nowhere. That, no way, they're not there anymore. All right? But we're at the absolute bottom here. And one of the reasons I'm proposing, one of the reasons that is, um, is that everybody else has data to support what they're saying. And I'll give you an example. Whoops. Remember I stopped, the car shakes. Now, a couple of days ago, I was coming down, the switch on the vehicle, and the brakes. Pillars. Calipers. It's the 
cannabis. It's okay. Oh, cannabis. Don't you want to take out some tools or something? No, that's not how we do things here. Don't worry about it. Roy. That's not natural. Is that, is that not beautiful, though? You know what I mean? That, this video alone, this little teeny video, changes everyone's perspective instantly on what is important in this profession. Because we get, like I said, our paradigm is one where we get used to, and I know you guys are very science-oriented, but even then, we get used to thinking some things that, are, that we think are normal are being perceived like this, which is the issue with attorneys. Because they see that we're like this. But one of the things I decided to do is set out to change that, and I did very, very, very significantly. The people in that case that we that won, we had two DCs and myself, and we, we killed it because the two DCs were all about objective data, and that's why we won that case, and myself. But the point is that I don't, would you take your car to this mechanic? Maybe. <laughs> you might. You got, you got a little cuckoo. <laughs> Just a little bit. You're the one sitting on a ball right now, so. Good for you, maybe. But see, when you do when you do ask a cardiologist to prove of a heart issue, they don't say it's I think that or I wonder if or you know I mean it's my, it's my opinion. What do they do? They do an EKG, right? They just do. What happens when you go to imagine if you went to a brain surgeon and they said they wanted to to remove a tumor based on their intuition? Would you let them do it? No. <laughs> You're going, maybe? <laughs> really? Huh? Yeah, maybe. Okay, well, then you're a unique individual, and uh, I make certain that, actually, that's really funny. Um, probably most, most people would say 99% would say no. We've got a unique individual. This is, this is going to be right here. This line is where our crazy people are right here in this little box. Right here. So, all right. Anyone would go to a dentist that drilled based on intuition? There we go. They're in the box. Okay, you guys have fun together. And if, would you go to see a, a dentist a drill based on intuition? Of course not, right? They don't. They have to show you. And every you want to see it yourself, right? So it's really important. This one blew my mind, though. Has anyone seen this yet? This is a. I'm a race car driver. When I go get my my wheels aligned, I go to the absolute best. Well, the absolute best now pulls this out. They use the exact same terminology on the device and everything else as chiropractors on with regards to wheel alignment. He showed me, and try to imagine that this is your practice as a chiropractor. The analogy is just so powerful. If, if, if you go to see an auto alignment guy and he says, I think the wheels are off, this, that, whatever, and kind of look at it, it feels funny, he drives it, versus someone who shows exactly what's going on. These are showing the wheels out. Do you think that I said, well, I want to get another opinion? No, I saw this and I said, fix it. The same thing as when patients see, which I know you saw, even though you did six of them, you probably saw a patient say, wow, what do I do about it? I don't know if you've seen that or not, but that's what happens. It's the same concept, that when you show objective data, what happens? They buy in and they recognize that there's something going on here that's real, or there's not. I mean, these ones are normal. But he said, hey, guess what, we've got to fix this. And I'm like, what? He's backed up three months now for alignments this guy, because he's got high-tech tools in his this place. And, and what are we doing like that? I mean, when auto mechanics are doing this, by the way, insurance, just like warranty work, warranties will not cover repairs without the code spit out. That's how it is for all cars now. They have to see a code or they're not going to cover it. Same thing. Insurance wants to see objective data to cover you. But the point is we live in this very visual, data-driven, evidence-based world, and you need to take advantage of it if you're going to thrive. If you're going to thrive out there, you really have to capitalize on it because everybody wants to see and hear and understand what's going on with them. And we don't believe anything because you are detectives and detectives gather evidence of all different kinds and put together, you know, you put together a clinical profile based on evidence, both subjective and objective. So one of the, one of the things I'm proposing is that the use of objective data, and this is an example of a, a motion, this is a, a motion EMG, we're measuring uh, down here, we're measuring range of motion at the bottom, and this is muscle activity on the top. So I'm measuring, when you do your range of motion measurements, wouldn't it be cool to be able to see if there's a muscle guarding that exists along with range of motion? Does that make sense to you at all? If you can see the guarding, you'd know if there was actually a pain in, in motion, right? And it's, you know, what's interesting is that uh, the key here, though, is that all these devices, what they all have in common is they pass the duct tape test. And this is something that's good to get to know what it is. You probably haven't heard this before, right? It's used a lot in law. 
What that means is that the duct tape test means if you do not require patient response input, the, the, the test is truly objective. So paper pencil tests are great, don't get me wrong, osteoastries are great, all that stuff's fantastic, but it's not truly, purely objective. There's, it's a sliding scale, it's a gray scale from more objective to less objective. And these, the most objective is one where there's no input required. And when you perform this test, this test, this test, and this test, it doesn't matter what the patient says. All right, does that make sense? And then the, what's happened is I wanted to level the playing field by actually in, in getting chiropractors to use objective data, the, the myovision, the Dynaram stuff that I talk about. And I thought I was leveling the playing field and the exact opposite occurred. I mean, opposite, meaning that I, we dominate now. They don't have a chance. There's not a single case where this, as a matter of fact, I'm going Saturday to prep an attorney for another case in Spokane. We just killed, we have a four hour jury trial where they spent four hours on the myovision itself and the jury sided with us because we showed the data and that's why. And so we're going to court again against the same expert who came to my course afterwards, by the way. The IME came to my class afterwards. And it doesn't make any difference. He's been saying the same thing for 20 years and he's not going to change, and the data still shows. And guess what, the one time that I had the insurer in a case hired a neurologist to use my equipment to test the patient, it was a thing of beauty. When you're using objective data, guess what? You both find the same exact results. I didn't have to testify. He said the exact same thing that I did, independent of me, because the data was the same. That was actually pretty interesting, because in Florida, it was the only case they used it in, and they said nope. And the only reason they say no is that if they can get away with not paying out at all, they're going to do it. And that's why they pay for this. So the truth is that's why this test is paid for so well. Like in Oregon, you can ask all the docs to get really well paid on it because they'd rather pay you guys for the test and just let think it, let it go than, than acknowledge the value of it and have everybody tested with this to determine whether or not they're injured. Because they figure out they may have to, their, their, their uh, accounts are time, they can save money by just uh, paying people on and letting this only work in the case of where it was used, because a lot of people don't know about it. They love that the image people have about this is false, and they promote it as much as they can. This is an example of an uh, expert witness, David, David Spanier, he's an MD, describing what I designed, describing exactly what I designed, but using his hands. And he talks about the value, he's a published uh, researcher, published in the uh, Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and he's talking about measuring range of motion. We have the patient uh, move and I assess their range of motion. And he measures how much the range of motion is. He looks at the smoothness of their motion. Smoothness. I remember showing this, uh, you'll see that we graph range of motion. It gives you smoothness. Um, he looks for symmetry. And then he starts looking for pain, which he feels by looking at the paraspinal muscles. He's saying, I'm feeling as they move, the pain. Well, guess what I did? I, this is, and this was done, someone sent me this going, you know, hey, guess what, your device was designed by... Release button, begin scanning. We measure range of motion here. This is our range of motion. And muscle activity on the top. So we're doing exactly what he says he does with his hands. But what's different when a computer does it and when you do it with electronic devices? What's different about it? Quantifiable. One is quantifiable, one is not. One is subjective, one is objective, okay? And that's what the difference is. We can quantify and we can see tiny changes that occur as the patient improves, and we use it that way. So this isn't just used to show there's injury. I have a case study here where we show that it was, the patient was at MMI, it was time to release them. You know, fighting and kicking. But the key in that case was the chiropractor said, you know, the cool thing was that it gave him this confidence, clinical confidence that it was right to release her at that point. That was the cool part. So, one of the, the, the things we're looking at, he talked about quality of motion, the, the smoothness of motion. We're graphing range of motion. Endpoint range of motion is great, it tells you, and it can be really valuable, there's no question about it. But think of how much more valuable it is when, and, and I didn't think about this yesterday, but one of the best analogies is, is endpoint range of motion is like a photograph. Graphed range of motion is like video, which is going to give you more information. Is that a good analogy or no? So it's kind of like that. So this is our range of motion. And so this is an example of somebody who's uh, a range of motions graph. This is your end point right here. Now in a normal person in a flexion, when you go to bend forward, what do the muscles do in full flexion? Anybody know? It's a reflex for them to shut off. They shut off, you can't control it. 
So in normal, the muscles shut off. Here they are bending forward, initiate the motion, muscles fire. These are in the lumbar paraspinals. Here they are standing back up. And so you can see in an injured person, muscles fire when they're in flexion. Also, you can see how the, the graph is really jittery. That's because the range of motion is not smooth. They're actually doing this on the way down. We're able to graph it. Very, very powerful stuff in front of a jury. And powerful in your practice. And it helps you, you know, determine whether or not what you, know, what you need to do with your patient. How does it work? Any questions, by the way? What time is this class over? I don't know. 12.30. Okay, good work. Um, how does it work? We're measuring electrical activity from muscles, all right? So we're just the, the, the summation of depolarizations below the skin is all we're measuring. It's the exact same technology as an EKG. It makes it so that when they ask, well, what is it? You know, it's an EKG. It's the same technology, okay? It's just significantly more sensitive because we're looking at tiny muscles. The heart muscle is huge. And so it's kind of like a blood pressure cuff or, or, or voltmeter for electrical activity from muscles. That's all it is. Now, the negative response people have to service EMG is this confusion over these two tools. This one, has anyone seen this one? You have. You've seen it. This one's called static EMG. Um, and I'm going to make it really clear, even though I've never done this for a PI case ever, any serious case, I never use it. I, ha I, I literally tossed this under the bus for about seven or eight years and said it was worthless, all right, on purpose. Why? Because this was so valuable that if I focused all my PI cases on this, I would establish the validity of this. Now, the truth is, this is extremely valuable. It's extreme, but this is again back to the range of motion. This is like the, the photograph versus the video. This shows a picture of muscle activity as a photograph. This is like the video of it. And that's what's different. Is this valuable? You better believe it is. It's just that I threw it under the bus because everyone had done this wrong for all these years and all the companies that made this stuff, they made crap, honestly. And this, it was never bad. It always worked well. Um, and the truth is that, you know, you pal does anyone palpate in here? Do you learn palpation? You find it valuable. Would you find an electronic form of palpation val valuable? You know, where you can actually d uh, quantify what you palpate and feel. Well, that's what this is. All it is electronic form of palpation. That's it. And so it's a great way to track progress. And your experience is interesting because it takes about 30 seconds for the test. So when you see it, you'll see that it's, it's not time consuming at all. Now, I've patented a new design, though, which has multiple electrodes. Is this what you used? No, it's the wheelie thing. Oh, yeah, that's not even an EMG. Okay. Yeah, that's thermography. That's temperature measurement. So people mix up that all the time. That's why I said that it's electroactivity, because most people do thermography measurements. This is way more, if you got an, uh, if patients actually responded well to that, this would just blow their minds, because they can feel muscle tension. They can't feel temperature differences. So that device measures skin temperature. This measures muscle activity. It's been a couple years. Yeah. So anyways, they're, they're usually together as a system. And that's what it was. That's why you, you saw the two, and you, you probably would mix. People always mix them up all the time. This is a different measure altogether. Still, that's that's a great tool, but it's that's for the doctors, not for the patient, really. This one is. Uh, anyways, it's also the AMA acknowledges the value of this by putting in their book. You know, the book you have the range of motion device you use, um, I believe, or isomed devices. That is the same device that this was. This is. It looks sort of like this. The one you have is that right? Is it a disc type thing or no? Yep. Well, it's the same device as this. This is just an electronic form of it. All right, so I took that, the AMA's one and I made it into an electronic version of it. And they put it in their book when they acknowledged. The reason it's in there is that, that uh, the guy who wrote this book realized after using the myovision for 12 years that range of motion on its own was really not enough. He needed to assess effort, and that's what the EMG part was for, the dynamic. The paradigm, this is an example of a real case. Endpoint range of motion. In this particular patient, their endpoint range of motion value is, and this is a big paradigm shift that's occurring. Um, and uh, uh, what we do is you measure endpoint range of motion. And, and the unfortunate part is that a ton of endpoint range of motion measurements are being used against us, so we don't even realize it. In that, you'll have a, about 30 to 40 percent of your patients will display normal range of motion, but with muscle guarding and pain. And have you seen this already yet? And you're in, in, you've seen it. So. What this does, this, this exposes that pain by measuring the muscle side. So it's like the lie detector part of it. But this is a real case. The endpoint range of motion measured by the IME was 52 degrees. Our endpoint, our, our graft range of motion at the endpoint was the same, 52 degrees. They were about the same. 
but the patient displayed extremely high muscle activity. So guess what? They were in pain. And this proved it. A normal muscle shut off inflection, an abnormal muscle far like crazy inflection. And so this proved that this person was in pain, led, leading to a $300,000 settlement. All right? This was zero. This would have been, and we, but we didn't disagree with them. We just said, guess what? That's true, but guess what? The patient's in pain for real. They're not faking. And, um, I'll skip. Release button. Begin scanning. Um, so the point is, this obviously it's not static EMG. Uh, now, static EMG, this is the test where you're seeing here. We actually touch down to the skin and do a quick reading of muscle activity, and it and gives you this point. graph. The bars, the length is proportional to level of muscle tension, the arrows point direction of imbalance. The yellow and red readings are the most important. And the reason is that red is, the red readings are high hyperactivity. Low readings are just as important. Why? Muscles that are in a chronic state of fatigue. Do you understand why? They're inactive. They're, well, they're, actually what happens is they become inactive, but even more interesting. You're right, they're inactive. But the way they're inactive is that they've been firing so long that they bulk up and shorten. And that creates this lack of activity and that they shut down. And those can be as important as the other ones can both yellow and red. Electronic form palpation, really good inner exam reliability. Uh, I called blood pressure. What we're doing now is we're measuring the EP stress score, which is uh, from a VA hospital study, which is a sum of all the activity. This changed the whole viewpoint on reproducibility, by the way. There were issues, people always said there was issues with reproducibility. Turns out, there, yes, with other machines, not with the MyVision. There's never been issues with reproducibility with it. But what was going on, and you can actually see it on this one. Uh, actually, no, you can't see it on this one, sorry. This is a pre and post adjustment test, and the sum of all the activity is this number here. Well, let's look at it, what happens when we actually do. Um, here's a study, and you can see that they correlated the VAS score with static EMG and found that at people that was three month study, the, the non responders their VS score stayed the same and their static EMG score didn't change statistically significantly. The responders to care, the VS score dropped, their pain levels dropped, and their, their static EMG EP stress score dropped significantly also. Here's, this, here's one of the published studies on this where it shows that with a, this is by the way, there's a control group, people say there's no studies, so this is a control group study showing static and dynamic EMG and chronic low back pain patients and the difference between them and controls was huge. And it was statistically significant. This is even funnier. Someone just sent me this recently. Um, they're using this for postural indicators of back pain in horses now. I had no idea. A French study they published it using my machine in, in Paris, in France. I got invited to speak at, at a huge horse show. I didn't know what I was going to talk about. Um, and they actually, here they are. They're saying that it's a, a better way of, of uh, as palpation. They're saying that it, compared to palpation, that it's actually more accurate. So here's an example of what the reproducibility question was about. So for years and years and years, the device is actually reproducible. You see very similar patterns all the time. Uh, but what was happening was all the other machines out there have done the test seated, which doesn't give you any information. You're seated, you do a static EMG, the patient's not maintaining their own posture, meaning that they're, you're measuring the chair's impact on the spine, so on. When you stand them like we do, we get much more information. The research studies say it's more valuable clinically. But you also have a problem where they do sway. But what happened when we, when we did a sum of all the readings, no matter whether they, they swayed left or right, the sum was the same. So this is only off by 10 millions of a volt between two tests done side by side. And matter of fact, one of the docs at my, one of my seminars, um, he channels me saying that, hey, this stuff has no reproducibility, it's a joke. I actually had him get up and do the test, never done it before ever, first test, and you can see it on the, My, on the MyVision website under eScan. You can see a video of it being done. Two tests in a row, and the, the results were off by about 3%, which is really, that's way better than you should expect for any physiologic test. But the point is that by doing this, this single number, which sums all of it, it doesn't matter this way. The actual sum activity is the same. It made it really clear that the device really works well. Again, high readings and low readings are important. This is actually somebody with a herniated disc at L4, L5. We can measure initial eight weeks, five months. You, this is a real test on people. This is, you can t test their progress, see what they're doing, like you would blood pressure. Think of it as a blood pressure cuff for spinal health. Also, you have someone that comes in really low readings, 
they're in that state that you just described, where they're inactive because the muscles are bulked up and shortened, you see the increase in activity at first in response to adjusting, and then it, it balances out. So this is an example of common problems. People that are working in computers like this end up with muscle activity in the mid-thoracic, very common thing to see. Um, and you tell them to put their monitor up high. You're the hero. I've seen docs do this before, and it's like, hey, just get your monitor work up high. Where is that? You're working on a laptop like this? You know, and suddenly they, you, know, you help solve the problem. Also, you see a lot of people that have super high readings in the upper cervical area. Those are about 80% of the time they have TMJ, and they were not, they, they were not aware that it was uh, something that they needed to do something about. So one of the reasons you do it, you do this test, it becomes a patient awareness tool, which brings out these things. We also send it, we do the test, we send it, I patented this, we send it to the phone, which is great because you save a lot of paper, but it also is something where um, don't downgrade the value of this stuff for the family members. When you're a chiropractor and you want to adjust, you're seeing a patient, the number of times they have somebody at home, to, I mean, when we did beta testing, it was really funny. Uh, one of the women said, oh, wow, now I can show my husband why I'm seeing my chiropractor. And she forwarded it to him. So what ends up happening, you haven't seen this yet, but you've seen it, you know what happens, they have it, someone at home who's going, well, why is seeing the chiropractor? Well, when you have something objective to show, it helps it easy to explain why you are seeing the chiropractor. You have some data. We included in, a, you know, the marketing side of this is real. You're running a business. It's got all your contact information, and that's what the patent's on is that it's embedded in the graphic. And you can, they're posting this stuff on Facebook, and there's no HIPAA violation here. The name is not on it. So they post it on Facebook, and they say, look at me, and um, it looks great on a phone. Everyone's got these giant phones. That's what led to me doing this before. Um, all right. And you can see that when the guards to this case, the reason we won, one of the reasons we won, guess what the AMA guide says that nobody even knows about? That muscle guarding is 5 to 8% impairment. And no one knows it. It's in there. Uh, it's established, there's, one of the other things people say is that there's no control group studies. This is a study published, and they used the myovision in the study done at the VA hospital. A uh, group of MDs did it, Journal of Occupational Environmental Medicine. Uh, found statistically significant differences. This is the largest case in chiropractic history other than the Wolf case, and nobody knows about it. And you know why you don't know about it? So this case was the state of Florida said there was no validity to the myovision testing, all right? The state of Florida said we're removing it from an approved list. Insurance never has to pay for it. So this was challenged by a chiropractor, Richard Merritt, and he called everyone in the chiropractic, all the researchers in the chiropractic profession to help him in this case. Nobody showed up. I'm the only person to show up to testify on behalf of the chiropractic profession, believe it or not. Not a single one showed up. Public record. But the reason, and this, this, so this was, this was literally myself against the state of Florida and all the insurance companies in the United States. They spent millions of dollars on this. And believe it or not, State Farm's firm bought my firm before trial. So we literally, I lost my, my law firm about a month before trial, believe it or not, because they could legally do that. There's a conflict of interest. And so they spent millions of dollars on this, and they still lost. But the, state, the reason you don't know about this case, the Florida Chiropractic Association testified against the chiropractic profession in this case, literally. And they, everyone said, and I know what really happened, they were paid, there was a payoff deal between the insurance companies and the Florida Chiropractic Association. Six of the expert witnesses have testified, I believe, six, four or six were from the FCA. And the FCA told all the chiropractors in Florida, don't worry, we've got this covered, and sent their experts to testify against them. It was disgusting. I mean, I'm in the room and I saw the guys go by and sit on the other side. I'm like, oh, wow. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know who the witnesses were going to be. But that was shocking to me when I saw people I knew testifying on behalf of the. But they lost. They lost the lower court. They lost at the superior court level, superior court level and the Supreme Court rejected the appeal. That led to reimbursement of the whole country at this point. This was about um, 10 years ago. Again, the AMA has it in their book. This is another case, $650,000. Um, again, they had a really famous expert witness, and, and the data was why we won this. Uh, Alan Fraley has just been out. He, he should be coming down here and, and teaching some classes, too, and helping you guys out. He's a chiropractor in, in Washington that's taking this on, this stuff on. And, and he is, uh, in fact, both of us got asked to speak at the uh, Association of Justice, which is all the PI attorneys in Washington State. The same thing's happening in Oregon, by the way. I just talked to them about that. They want me to speak to their PI attorneys here. Because we 
we just keep winning cases. And uh, he has just done a really good job. But try to imagine that you're in a courtroom, and this is what someone pulls up on the screen to show. And so this is a normal, and this is the patient, and you're, and you're looking at this. A jury gets this immediately. They're like, wow, this is a normal, and this is what it looks like, by the way, on the screen. We pull it up on the computer. This is an ideal over here, and this is the, the patient here. And you can see, again, what we're doing is we're measuring range of motion and muscle guarding. When you see the reading is really high versus low, that means they're injured. That means they're in pain. And that's what the jury sees. That's the end of the story. It goes, my God, we paid $1,200 for an MRI report, which shows nothing. In most of these cases, it shows nothing. It doesn't. It just doesn't, if you know that or not. Or we'll spend six fifty on an MD's opinion. With this, it's two hundred fifty dollars. He's just going two hundred fifty dollars. He thought it was going to be like a thousand dollars. It's and, and guess what? They don't. The, the byproduct. Of this is really interesting. They do not feel comfortable referring to one chiropractor. You understand why, right? They don't want to refer to a specific chiropractor because it makes them look bad, like they're in business with you guys, right? But what they have complete confidence in is sending the patient out for a test to you. So they have a list of everybody that has a machine. They have no trouble sending them to one particular person for a test like they would for any MRI or anything else, which leads to what? It's like it, it's an implied referral in a way to you. That's what's actually happening. Yes? Do you Canada? What, how Canada? Yeah. You're a Canadian? Yes. Wow. You there's must, there's that's there. why you're being so nice. Exactly. Yeah. Have you read the book, How to Be a Canadian? Uh, I wrote that book. <laughs> it's fantastic. There's a whole chapter on the word sorry. It's just fantastic. We use it for sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry. Sorry. It means like, it means sorry. It means sorry. It means sorry, like F U. It means it, everything. That's great. So, in Canada, um, where in Canada? Uh, BC. So, BC, there's actually attorneys in BC have been asking for people up there. We've got a couple of people doing it now. And so, it can be used to, things are, so they're, and just I'm not don't mean this in a bad way, but they're they're about ten years behind us right now, and it's only because um, of the fact that people abuse this up there. So I taught at CMCC for all of Canada. You have to go through my course to use this in Canada, and then uh, due to a lot of insurance regulation stuff, part of why this sort of like kind of died off up there, um, it's starting to come back now because uh, the, also in the UK, by the way because you can prove whether someone's got an injury or not, and that's becoming another new deal there. So yes, it's still, it's coming back in a way. It died off for a long time. Um, and it's, uh, the bottom line is that this data is so valuable that when there are cases, um, it, it can help you tremendously. And the static is used like crazy up in Canada, so there's a, there's a lot of people doing cash. Yeah, because the cash practices, are, and it's huge for cash practices. There's nothing better, actually. What's the price tag on this machine? Good question. Now I'll see if I can find out. I also don't care because it's so irrelevant, you know. But it's it's there. We need to read out there. No, I know I did. I know. <laughs> so I should know the answer now. It's great. Al. thanks for thanks for asking. You should ask as many questions as you want. There is a code for billing it. It's nine six zero zero two and nine six zero zero four. There wasn't before. There is now. So this covers it. Except for if you're from Canada, they don't have billing there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this just shows, actually one of the chiropractors said, oh, I never get paid on this. I'm like, well, when you're billing it, I he wasn't using the code, he was using unlisted code. But he said, please publish this because I had no idea that I was not billing it right. So it's, it's pretty simple. Because again, the image people had was from the static ENG that didn't have a code, so they thought this didn't either and they were wrong. So I'm just showing this, you get paid on it. And the, this is really the problem. So a lot of people have this really negative impression of doing personal injury stuff. Do you guys do that too? You don't want to do when you get out of school? Yes, no, maybe. The reason I say it is that it's like you're the experts on soft tissue injury. I mean, there's no one else that knows it better. Now, PTs may want to treat, but they don't want to diagnose it all. They don't really want to get into that side of it. They don't use computer stuff. And so, and MDs don't care either. Uh, but this is an arena that it used to be kind of dirty or unethical in the chiropractic profession and you end up playing little games with PI attorneys. When you have data to provide them, there's no need for a game. They want your data. That's what they want. So it's easy to develop a, a relationship with attorneys and provide this. And it's an area that you're an ex expert's in, and it pays double and triple what normal general stuff does. I mean, that's about that's how it works, extremely well. This is a really, really famous attorney who by chance did a deposition where this was used, and he wrote me right afterwards. 
I predict that as the word spreads, this will be the key to helping soft tissue plaintiffs all over the country get compensation they deserve. And um, anyways, this was a big deal that this guy actually had to say this because he's really, really well known. It's a super, yeah. Can you plug someone in there? Yeah, let's do that. Why not? I have a quick question. Yeah. Does this have, Who's hurting? Does Who's this hurting? have any, is it only able to read oh, really? like the, like if there's a muscle spasm, it has no like diagnostic value. Like can, it can't read down to like a demyelinating so the, the question that he's talking about has to do with the difference between needle and service EMG, which is what you're talking yeah. about, right? So let me explain that. I'll go right to it. Actually, I'm going to first show you these two just slides real quick. So there's only three cases you'll see with a flexion or extension, which is that a normal muscle shut off, the abnormal muscle, acute muscles fire like crazy, and a moderate or chronic muscles fire in full flexion a certain amount. See that? Okay. Now, in lateral flexions and rotations, when you do rotation, what, what happens? The muscles on fire on one side to create the rotation. The other side does not need to fire, right? That's what happens in a normal person. Muscles, you go to the, do a rotation. The left side is blue, right is red. Left side fires, right does not because it doesn't need to. This does stabilize. It's firing, but it doesn't fire that much. What is guarding? Guarding really is when both sides fire. When you go to do a rotation, as an example, you go to a rotation, it hurts. What happens? Muscles fired to immobilize, correct? And that's what this is. So that's all we're doing is documenting that guarding. Muscles fire together in an acute case. They fire sort of together in a chronic or moderate case. All right? Does that make sense? That's all, you're, that's all this is doing. It's that simple. And we're measuring range of motion simultaneously. Uh, I have another question. Um, so I treated a patient last week who had been treated by a previous chiropractor and I believe misdiagnosed. What I found was that that patient had a pulled uh, quadratus labrum. Mm -hmm. um, would this machine have detected that previously to this yes, whole thing? Yes, without question. Because so, that pulled it, what will happen is there's going to be a compensation pattern that's going to show the weak side due to that firing like crazy. Because there's going to be that compensatory pattern. That's what this is for. Also, if there's ligamentous instability, muscles go nuts. They go crazy in response to that because there's an instability. What I saw yesterday was this, the guy, but he was actually trying to fake the test. I'm trying to figure out. If you notice, though, I didn't bring the, I should have brought this up yet. said if you noticed, there wasn't consistency between the readings, which is what you look for with range of motion. It's the same thing. That's why I was confused about, like, what, you know, I thought he was actually trying to do an honest, so I was trying to, like, assess it as an honest one, but I should just say, you know, it's obvious you're faking this because it's not, you know, it's not consistent across, you know, as he was trying it. The point is that when you see ligamentous instability, it appears as this unstable muscle firing. So let's do uh, let's do the test. But I'm going to show you one more thing. We're done, which is this. This is to answer your question. I want to make sure I put this. I stuck I stuck the slide in just for you just now. Okay. So the this question is the most common. This is the most common thing that insurers, IMEs, everyone brings up in the courtroom, and I've got court records to show it to discredit the value of service EMG. They reference this paper, Technology Review, the Use of Service EMG, EMG in Diagnosis and Treatment of Nerve and Muscle Disorders, American Academy of Electrodiagnostic Medicine. And so they're talking, the Technology Review discusses the use of service EMG in diagnosis of nerve and muscle. Disorders of nerve and muscle include neuropathies, we're the stuff you're talking about, right? So the question is, can you do this with service EMG? Absolutely not. We are not looking for nerve damage with this. That's what needle EMG is for. They're different tests. We're looking for that muscle guarding that correlates with soft tissue injury. Totally different. What about the difference between spasticity seen in MS compared, because that can take years to actually come about, and it, to a lot of people it comes off as just a muscle spasm. And so how did, like, this is obviously going to pick that up. It would. But how oh, you could be mismanaging someone for three years if you're just focused. Well, if it's not something that dramatically affects their lives, I mean, you're, you're going to mismanage them anyways. No one's going to notice it. I mean, how do you diagnose MS if it doesn't pre present itself in, in, a str in a stronger way? I mean, how would you? I guess it was, I mean, MS is kind of a drastic one because you're right. going to get other symptoms with it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of just knowing if a muscle spasm is coming from something other than just some irritation and well, you know what, the best analogy to answer that question, the best analogy to that is the, the, the thermometer. And I brought this up yesterday, but the thermometer is something that an MD will use or you use to see if the patient has an elevated temperature. Now, you get that elevated temperature, tells you something's wrong, right? 
Does it tell you where the problem is? This is the same thing. This correlates with that problem, and it helps give you a clue that there is one. So it's used that way, but that's a great question. But what's key here is this paper that they use to discredit service EMG supports its use. Because what it says, right at the first thing it says in the first, the second, is the second paragraph, it's the first paragraph on the right hand side of the paper, is hey, guess what? This doesn't apply to the use of service EMG when it comes to, the, to pain as an entity independent of nerve damage. I mean, this thing had killed on this every single time. They used it to say, well, there's no value to service EMG because it's not needle EMG. No one said it is. I mean, that's what this says. It's so funny. But the truth is, that this, the paper they rely on says the exact opposite of what they try to say, but the fact is nobody knows how to read the literature. So everyone reads it and goes, oh no, this paper says there's no validity to it. Well, what's it actually saying? Nothing related at all. We're not using it for that purpose. So, let's actually do tests. Well, this was great. Um, in the case, the, uh, the expert witness, $200 in our expert witness said, needle EMG is the only EMG, and they said that there's very few, if any, research papers on service EMG. If you do a PubMed search, this is the number that shows up as of October. 8,267. What happened to his credibility at that point? That was a tough one. So, uh, Anyways, and here's the needle and surface where someone actually, to go further with it, someone actually said, well, the 70s group of MDs said, let's look at needle and surface simultaneously and see what happens. And they, here's a graph showing needle and surface, and they concluded that all functional phases were shown in surface. But when evaluating for back pain, it said specifically that, that service EMG was more valuable. That's what this paper concluded. And so this is another one of those things where this comes up and I nail, I mean, it's so easy. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, anyways, even Croft, which they reference Croft as saying there's, he says there's no value to service EMG. Yeah, that was in 2000. In 2004, he published, look how valuable service EMG is. He discusses that, that um, Using EMG, we can discriminate between normal necks and abnormal necks. This is Art Croft saying that. Do you know who he is? You guys don't know who Art Croft is? We do. Oh, he's like one of the most. Is he not taught at the school, or is? I'm curious. He's a whiplash guy. Huh? We're not big name droppers. <laughs> no, like really. Well, it's not a name drop. He's a researcher. Right. He published. You know the stuff where they crash cars is the, with people in them. He's the one that did all that. So he's like. Really, an important part of this profession. That's why he's not a name. It's not a name drop. Croft isn't referenced as a name drop. He actually he has a t what's the process? He he has a technique for evaluating injury. I can't remember what it's called. The Croft guidelines. Those those are applied like um, like a, it's a guideline. I'm surprised that uh, it's actually one. Of, some people I know know all about it here. I'm, I'm surprised. Anyways, he shows it being used and points out the same thing. Um, Let's go and do tests now. Here's a, someone asked this yesterday, here's the answer to it. Yes, someone did a meta-analysis of all the EMG data and found that yes, that when you combine EMG and range of motion, this occurred in the, I filed for patents on the combination of the two. They wrote this paper independent of, I didn't even know them. They wrote this paper on the value of combining the two at the same time as being published as I filed patents on the combination of the two. So it became clear and let's, uh, let's do tests on you guys. All right. Right, let's, by the way, I can go 50 feet away with it, which is really cool for screenings if you're going to do them. Um, actually, I, oh, I can still do it on you. What I like to do is I like to put them on the masseters, and then what ends up happening is I have you tense up your jaw. Relax. Can you see it on the screen? Tense up. And what ends up happening is they go, wow, this thing really does work. Tense up. Relax. You're a little anterior. I don't care. <laughs> and you're an asshole. <laughs> you're a little interior. You know, well, how's this? Um, anyways, you don't know. Do <laughs> well, then maybe I'm right. All right, you're definitely not Canadian. I can tell that. New York. They would say instead. They say, "Pardon me, but perhaps you might be interior." Right. <laughs> All right, so we touched down. So what we're going to do, now typically I wipe the skin with alcohol, I'm not going to do it. Uh, we don't like the patient seeing the screen when I'm doing the test. I don't care if you do, but if you're going to look straight, look straight ahead. So we touch down. The thing takes a reading, the readings drop. Um, hold on. It auto scans. I should have cleaned the skin. Actually, it's okay. Let me just, let me just review this one. I haven't had a shower in days. I can tell. C7. 
The only reason I say that is that it's hot outside. When it's hot out is when you usually want to use alcohol to clean the skin, but I'm really going to skip it. And I, I just noticed the reason I did I noticed there was an issue was the reading didn't drop quickly on one level. That's how I know that it's, the skin needs to be clean. But you'll see that it'll probably drop just fine right now. C7. Drop your arms, just have your legs. There you go. T4. T8. I'm not marking sites here, we're just doing this for fun. T12. L4. Test complete. Okay, so this is great because everyone asks me this, like, well, do you ever see anyone that looks pretty normal? Well, guess what? It looks pretty normal. Mostly pink. Yeah, and so the only thing that shows up is your, see how it's yellow down here? This is the only area that I'd show much concern. Everything else, you look really good. This is really surprising. But um, do you have any issues down here, or is that normal? Uh, so I have some SI pain from. Mm -hmm. But it's not, still it's not, this is showing, do you have any specific pain right now, or are you doing pretty good? Pretty good. And that's what this shows. So I love that because the, everyone always says, well, it probably shows problems with everybody. No, it doesn't. Stay on, I'm going to do it another one. Do it again, I'll show you. The reason I want to show a second one is show the test and retest. Whoops. But he's not a great person to do this thing because he doesn't show that much. Still. Why else do people look abnormal on these tests in a chiropractor's office when you do them? Because they came to see you because they have a back problem. All right? When we do these tests on normal people, they really show as normal. C3. Seven. When a reading Gee, doesn't drop quickly, you know you have bad contact with the skin. That's it. Maybe it's the machine. Nope. G8. Oh, it could be the machine. It's just one thing at a time. You find that the skin contact doesn't help, then there's some issue with the machine. This one actually needs an electrode to replace, which is why it's not wanting to. That's one of the reasons why it's not stabilizing. It's okay. Don't lift your arm off. Sorry. It's okay. T12. Okay. Done in a second. See how that consistently doesn't want to drop on just one electrode? That one is literally worn out and needs to be replaced. It's not going to want to stabilize. You have to toss that reading out. L4. So we have this is where the, the test itself, if you have an electric needs to be replaced, it will act where it like that. L4. Test complete. Okay, so you see we get almost the exact same thing twice. Let's see what the value is for. So 91 and 82, the difference is literally nine millionths of a volt, but it's not that much. I mean, you expect a 15% variation between tests uh, in any physiologic test. As you know, beginning and end of a uh, blood pressure test within one patient visit, you can see very, very little. So it's actually really good. But that's even with this issue right here. We throw, toss this one out, and you see they're almost exactly the same. All right? So let's do the motion one. And what's neat is that you'll notice that we end up doing, with the exception of placing the electrodes here, we're basically doing a range of motion measurement. It takes the same time, so we're just measuring, we're recording the dynamic EMG at the same time. So it's the same amount of time as doing range of motion measurements. All right, so stand up. Great, perfect. 
Okay, so you can see I've got, turn this way, I've got EKG electrodes on them, ground, our measurement electrodes left and right sides. All right, so let's go in here. What's your last name? It's a long one, R-U-S-C-H-E-I-N-S-K-I. -S -S and your first name? Blake. Let's we'll stumble together, isn't that funny? You should have a name. What should your first name be? What was the relative's first name on the, your father's side? Joseph. Okay, that's fine. All right, Diana, um, there's got to be more, you know. Yeah. Range of motion devices are here. We turn this on. And one at a time, you see the lights come on. It tells you that it's connected. All right, so now what we're doing is we're measuring again range of motion at the bottom and then muscle activity at the top. I'm going to have you come over here a little bit there. Okay, now I'm going to have you do a full flexion. Drop your head first and grab and hang naturally a little faster. Come back up. Flexion. Come back up. That's great. All right, so you're just going to drop and hang naturally. I just literally place the devices down like this. You can see I'm actually just doing range of motion. So, and you can see on the screen. Release button, begin scanning. One minute forward, drop and hang naturally. Back up. Forward. Back up. This is very interesting clinically. I'll explain after we stop. Forward. Back up. Before we go further to the other test, I'm going to explain this one really quick because it's too interesting. All right. So you remember that a normal individual, with a normal individual, muscles are supposed to shut off in full flexion. Does he shut off in full flexion? Do they shut off in full flexion? Okay, here he is in full, uh, sorry, you can't see the, the pictures. This is him in full flexion. You see how the muscles shut, shut off in full, that's normal. But you see when he stands back up, his left and right side fire is significantly different. He's just doing this when he stands up. He's rotating left first. That's, actually, that's what you're actually doing. That clinically means something, that he may have a fixation or something, which is leading to that rotation. But what's weirder is when you go back to neutral, your left side doesn't want to drop down as quickly as it should, which means that your left side is the one irritated. Does that make sense to you? And that, so that's what this does. It actually shows you exactly, yes. Does that mean it's irritated or that it's uh, compensating for the other side that's not doing the trick? One or the other. Okay. It could be one or the other. And that's where you come in as a doctor and you take this data and weave it into your clinical profile. Let's see some flexion again there, buddy. Flexion? Do it again. Yep. What's your name? Thomas. Thomas. Extensions one that usually hurts me. Yeah, well, we'll see. And that's where you see a lot of instability show up as an extension. We'll do it though. Ready? We'll do two extensions. I like to have them, do you know how you do range of motion where you do five or whatever it is, you get 10%? What I do instead is do two trials to get them to understand, get rid of the training effect, and then do the measurement. So I'm going to do two extensions. Go back. Arms at the side? Uh, how do you do them? I usually put arms at the side. It's up to you. Is that what you do too? Or that's great. Doesn't make any difference to me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, back up. Now, the reason for the arms to the side for you is what? Like, what's the? It's just a comfort thing. Got it. Okay. okay. I don't yeah. have to. Right. No, I mean, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just curious, like, what happens clinically? Is it give you more stability or less stability, or is it just purely a, a psychological thing? Arms straight overhead. It's just to standardize. Right. You have a standard that's exactly what I said. Right. And that's exactly what I said. Whatever you want to do, just stick to it. So go ahead and turn to the side if you want to. All right. I put these things so that they're actually now they're staggered so he doesn't hit them. So they go over each other and go backwards a lot. So they're staggered a little bit. And she'll turn this way so they can see.